Hello, I'm Jamie Forbes, and I'm here with Lindsay Charlop, and we're here to discuss Lindsay's involvement with the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area as a Field Project Outreach Coordinator. Correct, Lindsay? So the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area is one of eight partnerships for regional invasive species management throughout New York State. So we're tasked by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to coordinate a response to invasive species in a given area. So we cover Long Island and Staten Island. So that's Nassau, Suffolk, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island counties. And then the other partnerships for regional invasive species management areas or PRISMs as they're abbreviated, they cover other parts of the state. So basically what we're doing is we are um, sort of communicating with organizations throughout the state, keeping tabs on where invasive species are on Long Island and in Staten Island, where they're coming in, um, what species are widespread versus which species are just emerging, and coordinating with the rest of the state to strategize about what to do about these, these species. So in my role, um, our, our organization, it's just me and my coworker, Bill, and so we, we both do a bit of everything. Um, so uh, it's a lot of planning, a lot of prioritization, and a lot of field visits, um, going out to, to places where we're getting reports of invasive species, seeing what's going on, um, and coordinating with whoever owns the property that the invasive species is found on to develop a response. So, um, um so you're basically in, in the metro area, I'm going to say from Staten Island through Suffolk County. Right. Is that correct? And then when I saw your website, um, it's a very interesting website and I have seen you uh, present and, and this is why I requested an interview with you because I find this so fascinating. So how you, People call in and they identify invasive species. How does this process really work for you? And how do you identify the species? You get called in, you go and you see what's around and, and that's how it works? Yeah, so there are two ways that we get reports for, well, there are a few ways that we get reports for invasive species. We either hear it from someone who knows of us, they contact us directly. There are also a couple of phone apps that we use. So one is called um, IMAP Invasives, and that was developed by the state, by the New York Natural Heritage Program for this particular purpose, for um, citizen scientists and land managers to report invasive species, and um, Bill and I get those notifications to our email inbox, so we have those coming in. Um, from a citizen science perspective, sometimes it's a little bit challenging because um, this app requires that you already know what you're looking at. And a lot of citizen sciences, especially on Long Island, it's a very metropolitan area. Um, much of it is quite urban, as you said. Um, a lot of people don't have that species ID experience. So there's another app that we use called iNaturalist. Um, and that basically, uh, anybody can use it. And you take a picture of, a, of something that you're seeing, it could be a plant or an animal or a crab or anything. Um, and you, the app will identify it for you and submit a report to a database that we can look at. Anyone can look at it, but we use it a lot. And so that's a great way to kind of um, get a sense of what people are seeing out on the landscape. Um, iNaturalist, we're, we're doing a lot to promote its use in, uh, for our citizen scientists. Um, I think it's a great entry point for people who don't have that species ID experience, but still want to learn and get familiar with what's going on around them and uh, what's out there. So, so tell me about, in your current role, what species have you seen coming in this year? Do you know that you haven't seen before? And excuse me, that's my invasive, invasive dog <laughs> barking. But um, which species have you seen arriving? I know that the, uh, that the algaes are blooming and that they're invasive. And I didn't see new ones listed, but that they're already in, invasive. What's new? Anything new in, the, uh, in this metro area that we haven't seen before? Sure, so um, we have on our website a list of species that are ranked by how abundant they are on the island. And so the sort of the way that we look at it is um, not necessarily is the species newly coming in, but how abundant is it? So 
generally speaking, species that are less abundant haven't been here for that long. Um, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes they're here and just not spreading rapidly. We're always kind of gathering information as we, as, as these reports come in and as we're checking on what's going on in the landscape. But um, some species that are relatively um, low in abundance on Long Island that are probably relatively new, um, Haliosmanthus, common landscaping plant um, that we're seeing escape into the wild. Um, Italian arum, uh, another one that is, uh, uh, I believe for landscaping, but all of these plants, a lot of these plants were brought in for landscaping, but have a tendency to escape. Um, and that's what makes them invasive. That's what makes them a problem. So on Long Island, when you see invasive species coming in, a lot of the time they've been here as ornamentals and now they're escaping for some reason. And they um, encroach. They just go into areas that kind of take over the areas that they're going into right. and the natural species or the natural environment, the, the ecosystem gets a little upset by their invasiveness. Right. Right, so basically these species spread unchecked because they have no natural predators here. Um, you know, they're competing with native species that are not used to competing with them. So, um, you know, they have an advantage in that way. Um, and often they're, they're aggressive. They spread rapidly. They grow really fast. They're difficult to kill. They have immense root systems. Um, the common ones are, are probably species that you've seen all over the place. So a lot of the vines like oriental bittersweet or wisteria. Um, there are a lot of shrubs that are thorny like multiflora rose and Japanese barberry. These were really common um, hedge species and were brought in back in the day for that purpose. And now um, they've sort of spread out of control in forest ecosystems and, and they basically just displace. Take over. Yeah. yeah. And so when you're talking about plants and you have invasive plants taking over places where native plants were, um, you know, it's out crowding out those plants, but also the wildlife that use those native plants often don't know how to use the invasive plants. They don't even recognize it as a food source or a place to live um, because they, they didn't co-evolve with it. They're not familiar with it. And, you know, the development of those sort of uh, symbioses, those interactions, they take a lot longer. They take thousands and millions of years and the landscape is changing a lot faster than that. Um, and these invasive species are taking over faster than that. So that's why it's a, a problem. Do you know which um, natural species, uh, you know, birds or aquatic life are being displaced by these invasive species? Well, often it's actually big groups of species. Um, so for example, in the pine barrens on Long Island, um, miscanthus or, or silver grass species. They're a very common landscaping plant, but it seems like they're just starting to really escape in the pine barrens. Um, at least that's my understanding. And um, these, these species sort of outcompete a lot of grassland species, like for example, blue grasses, Indian grasses, switch. And these are, these grasses, so for example, um, the blue stems, um, they're considered some of the best nesting habitat for birds for native birds, generally. They also, their seeds are a good source of food for a variety of different kinds of wildlife. Um, you know, when we're talking about displacing other plants as well, we're talking about displacing pollinator habitat. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, species that have co-evolved with native pollinators no longer being available to those pollinators. And study after study after study has shown that um, native pollinators are much better at pollinating crops that we have. Um, they're more efficient and they survive better in the landscape. And so, you know, two thirds of the foods that we eat, that humans eat, rely on pollinators. So this is really important that, you know, they have habitat, that they have food in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, our croplands are not enough on their own. And the pollinators would be butterflies, bees, bumblebees. Um, yeah. Yeah, butterflies, bees, flies, um, some beetles, sometimes ants, you know, they're, when you start to look closely at plants and what uh, insects are using them, um, you'll see all kinds of different creatures and especially on a, in a native habitat and a functioning native habitat is just bustling with activity. Um, well, I've noticed the wisteria is spreading. And yes. I, I, I mean, I was flabbergasted. And then some of the roses are spreading. Mm -hmm. And you can, see the, you can see the outgrowth from the 
the masonry wall on the LIE, which is meant as a, a barrier for sound, the wisteria and the rose just root through. They just yeah. root through the cement. That's how persistent life can be. Yeah, um, these species are very impressive in many ways. Um, Japanese knotweed is another common invasive species, and I've seen it grow up through cement. I mean, like you're saying, it can grow through, uh, you know, rock walls or concrete. They're very, very aggressive and pervasive, but impressive at the same time. <laughs> I have an appreciation for them. And um, what, in your professional opinion, uh, you have found that human beings and transportation and what are the other contributing factors to the spread of invasive species, whether they be plant or animal? So um, as you brought up, a lot of the ways that these species are transported around are unintentionally uh, by people. Sometimes they're brought in for a particular purpose, like for an ornamental or um, you know, for use as erosion control. In the example, kudzu, the kudzu vine was originally brought in for that. Um, and people don't realize the negative consequences of them. Um, and so, you know, people are still bringing in new species all the time. Um, and so, you know, sort of a, um, a, a lack of, not lack, but there, there needs to be more of an understanding of how choosing native species is so much more beneficial for the wildlife and the environment. And um, which groups and organizations do you work with that offer native species as an alternative to um, uh, in, imported species that might do the same job? Do you have a list? Do you have a website? Well, we, our sister organization here on Long Island is the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, uh, LINPI, and they are actually, uh, their whole role is to propagate native plants um, and they use those for restoration projects, but also they have plant sales. They would have had one this spring, um, if not for the COVID-19 situation, but I believe they'll be having one this fall. So they're, um, you know, they collect native seed from all over Long Island. So it's not just plants that are native to the region, um, but it's actually the same genotype that's native to the region, the, the actual individuals evolved here on Long Island. Um, and so they propagate those in greenhouses and those are available. And they're, they're connected with, uh, you know, networks of organizations that uh, do similar work and are, are promoting native species use. And this is a, this is a statewide uh, coordinated effort through um, statewide facilities, statewide offices and other organizations to promote a natural habitat. So my understanding is that the, in, the invasive species component is coordinated statewide. I'm not aware of a statewide native plant network that's similar to ours. There, okay. there may be one. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I know that some of the other partnerships for regional invasive species management throughout the state are becoming interested in having an arrangement similar to LISMA's where there's an invasive species coordinator and they're directly affiliated with a native species provider uh, and propagator. Uh, what do you think is the most uh, impactful aspect of your work? Um, I think that the issue of invasive species seems huge to a lot of people. And so a lot of what we do is kind of breaking down the issue um, and sort of giving different audiences, um, you know, the pieces that they can contribute to. Um, you know, sometimes environmental issues just seem overwhelming. And so, and invasive species, once you really look and start to understand the scale of the problem, I think it's similar to something like climate change, where, you know, it's an, it's an immense issue and it's not always easy to know, uh, you know, what your role is in helping. Um, and so I think a lot of what we aim to do is provide people with the resources to contribute to the solution wherever they are. So if that's, you know, just people in their gardens, um, if it's land managers at a particular site, um, you know, we try to take what the efforts that all of these individuals and organizations are doing and make it part of a bigger picture. So do you think that um, uh, factors like uh, the very warm winter we had, which might be indicative of climate change on your website, it stated that some of these plants that are invasive got a very good head start over the warm winter into the spring uh, to do their invasion. 
Um, are they connected and coordinated in some way, the, the changing climate, the changing atmosphere, pollution, and these invasive species? Yes, absolutely. Um, so a lot of invasive species, um, generally speaking, do better in conditions that other plants maybe are a little bit more picky about. Um, so they can thrive in a wide range of temperature conditions, let's say, um, and, uh, you know, and pollution conditions. These are plants that are opportunists. They're not picky. Um, in terms of the, the contribution of, of climate change to species invasion, there's definitely a correlation. Um, for example, if you look at invasive pests, um, we haven't really talked about that much yet, yes. but yes. things like southern pine beetle, um, yes. that's a really big problem among island. The native range of southern pine beetle is actually the southern United States and Central America. And, you know, it may have come up here because in part of climate change, now it's certainly surviving here because the winters aren't cold enough to kill them off. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they can survive quite well in the new conditions. Maybe 50 years ago, the cold winters would have been enough to eradicate them. Um, another invasive species that's definitely spreading because of climate change is the European green crab, um, which is all over Long Island and it's gradually encroaching up the east coast of, of uh, the United States and into Canada. Um, this is a crab that is just a voracious eater. It eats mussels, it eats clams, scallops, um, and it's been sort of pinpointed as a cause of major, major decline for uh, the shellfish industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it also destroys lobster uh, nursery habitat. Um, so it's, it's associated with uh, the decline of lobster populations as well, which is an economic issue. Um, and that species is definitely better able to survive because of changing climates and warmer so winter waters. What brings this species to the Eastern seaboard? So this particular species was probably brought over by accident, um, as were many others, but in, in ship ballast. Bilge water? Yeah. Yeah, bilge water. So, um, you know, a lot of species, especially those that are not picky about their conditions, can survive, you know, for a surprising amount of time, even in like an enclosed space like that with no light and whatnot. Um, and they can make it long distances across oceans. Oh, fascinating. Oh, any mammals that are invading? There are invasive mammals. Um, there's the, let's see, I believe it's called the Eurasian wild boar. That's not an issue on Long oh, Island, but upstate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've I'm not had a personal experience with uh, 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 the wild boar, but that is an issue upstate, I believe. Yeah, so somebody had to have brought it over, raised it and let it loose. Yeah, yeah, right. and that does happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um, in Florida, there's a really big problem with Burmese pythons. Yeah, I have uh, yeah. A lot of people have probably heard about that because Burmese pythons, unlike some of these other invasive species, are big and scary. And uh, yeah, uh, they were originally brought over as pets. And enough people released their Burmese pythons into the, you know, their unwanted Burmese pythons into the uh, landscape that they're able to start a population and reproduce, and they're quite happy there. And um, now they're decimating the small mammal population and medium mammal population. They're, they're uh, impressive predators as well. Um, so that's, that does happen frequently. And there's um, nothing like that on Long Island though. There's... There are, um, nothing like that in particular, but in terms of pets that have been released on accident um, and are forming their own populations, there's the red-eared slider. Uh, which is a turtle species. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Um, it, it's all over pet stores, um, and it does quite well here when released into the wild. These turtles live, I believe, around the order of 80 to 100 years, and people don't realize that they're taking on that commitment when they adopt one. So they realize, oh, the turtle's going to be much older than they expected, uh, or maybe it's growing much bigger than they expected, and they release um, that into the wild. Sometimes species escape also from like aquarium tanks that people dump out. Um, so there's the mystery snails, the Chinese and Japanese mystery snail. And they probably came over that way uh, from people's fish tanks. And Goldfish what do they do? are a problem. What do um, they do? Too? The snails. Mm -hmm. um, they outcompete native snails. Um, you know, I'm not 100% familiar with their specific ecosystem dynamics, but um, they're incredibly abundant. And what that means to me is that they're outcompeting 
yeah. native mollusks that occupy similar niches yeah. and are probably not as useful to you know the wildlife that need those mollusks as food. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, I knew about the turtles. I didn't know about the snails. And goldfish are carp, right? They just, they grow up to be carp. They get big. They're not attractive when they're big. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how big they grow up to be, but yes, they're, they, well, some of them they do the grow up. Aren't they the ones that people keep in the outdoor ponds? And... I think that's koi. Koi? The goldfish are I, uh, smaller. The little... They're oh, kept okay. in tanks, but oh, they no, make it out into the, into the landscape and they're considered and who do they uh, invasive compete with? as well. Who do they compete with? Who do they compete with? with? Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with specific species, but native fish. Um, a lot of these species are aggressive in addition to just being voracious. And so they'll, they'll actually bully uh, native, native species out of habitats that they need for yes. nesting or rearing their young or feeding or mating or whatever it might be. Um, so red-eared sliders are, are notorious for that. I've actually observed that um, they, they bully native turtles out of of wetlands. The eastern um, box turtle? The eastern box turtle is actually largely terrestrial. Yes. Um, painted turtles, snapping turtles. Um, upstate where I was working before we had Blanding's turtles which are considered threatened in the state um, and I was involved with the trapping where we were tagging them and, and radio tracking them. Um, and you know I've, I've been involved with that for a number of years and then one year we noticed that in the best pond to catch these turtles, we were only coming up with uh, red-eared sliders. Oh, and they were sort of, we didn't come up with a single uh, Blanding's turtle and um, realized that the sliders were just So what do you think out. is the most important aspect of work that your organization is currently do doing for the public? For the public? Um, for I the think environment? For the environment. Well, I think that really what our organization is, is a resource. Um, you know, we provide information on how to deal with these species. And like I said, the guidelines for prioritization, um, you know, so that, so that no matter who you are on the island, it's our goal that you have an understanding of, you know, if you come across a certain species, what should you do about it? Um, you know, is it something that we need to be paying attention to? Or is it something that's really widespread? Um, you know, how do you control it in your own yard? What do you replace it with? Um, so I think that's, that's our, our role. Um, I think that the most important thing that people can do is get familiar with what's out there, what's on the landscape, what's in their garden. Um, and, you know, to understand that um, you know, not all green spaces are created equal. There's something, there's kind of a phenomenon that, that we call green blindness. And many of us are guilty of this. I grew up with this. I grew up in an urban area of Long Island. Um, and to me, you know, nature was nature. If it's green, it's good. Um, and the more you learn, the more you learn that that's actually not the case. Um, you know, a wall of invasive wisteria is not the same as a forest with oak trees and pine trees and habitat that is good for wildlife and supports pollinators that's important to us. Um, and so, yeah, I think getting, getting aware, learning. Um, and so report, using iNaturalist is a great way to start. Yep, iNaturalist.org. Um, you just have to sign up, create a free account, and then you download the app onto your phone. Um, and it's great because, you know, anyone can identify anything that they want at any time. Most people have their phone on them often, more often than they have a field guide, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> the really important thing that people can do is um, think about how they might be transporting things accidentally and try to avoid doing that. So, you know, when you go hiking upstate before you go, brush off your boots with a dish brush. You know, avoid taking little fragments of dirt, little seeds that might be in those fragments, plant particles. That can actually reproduce in a different uh, ecosystem, uh, believe it or not. Um, you know, moving compost around, buying firewood down here and bringing it up there. We always tell people buy it where you burn it or buy heat treated oh, firewood so that invasive pests can't catch a ride. You know, we don't want southern pine beetle oh, uh, infested wood making its way uh, to different, different habitats. Um, oh. When you bring your boat from water body to water body, make sure there's no plants hanging on, no critters hanging on, let your boat dry completely. Um, so there are a lot of really simple actions that people can take to just help prevent 
moving things around unintentionally. Um, and that's by far the best thing to do. Um, prevention is by far the most efficient sort of use of effort in terms of um, addressing the issue of invasive species. Once you get to the point where you have to start controlling a population or managing it, you're looking at a way less efficient use of resources and effort. I guess it's sort of like COVID-19. It is very much, <laughs> yeah. We've been having a lot of conversations in the workplace about how people are kind of thinking in this way of, um, you know, spreading things unintentionally and, and sort of adopting principles that we've been kind of aware of and trying to use for a while. Um, you know, not to this, not in quite the same way. You know, we're not out similar. in the ecosystem with gloves, but. <laughs> yeah, but it's very similar. It's, it's, yes. a, it's a mindset, as you said, that I find that very interesting. What in your background prepared you for this type of work? Um, so, um, like I said, I grew up in an urban area, um, not really knowing anything about nature. Um, but for some reason, even though I didn't know anything about nature, I always really cared about it. Um, you know, there was a, a woods that I used to go to as a little kid with my parents and um, it got cleared to build some condos and that really bothered me. And it didn't seem to bother anyone else. <laughs> um, and I was confused about that. And, um, you know, it seemed like important that that, that shouldn't have happened. Um, sure. And so when I went to school, um, I studied environmental uh, studies, but it wasn't quite, it was very sociology focused. And then I finally clicked with um, ecology focused people. And I guess started learning about how, you know, these interactions in nature are so important, not just inherently for, you know, their beauty and their, um, you know, how wonderful they are and, and the wonder that you feel when you're surrounded by nature, but also, um, you know, because of, of all of the things that they do for us. And um, in, after college, I was very lucky to get work that, that gave me a lot of experience with helping organizations plan for what to do about their invasive species. Um, I designed a couple of management plans for different organizations, for different ecological preserves. Um, well, that's interesting. And, yeah. You yeah, know, it's very interesting. You just have a, an aesthetic sensitivity and you lined up your educational background with this and then developed your process. I, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> it I, sort of I, fell into place. It, it was one of those journeys that was quite roundabout. Mm -hmm. It was synergistic, I guess, huh? Great yeah. Synchronicity, yeah. yeah. I, I'm a big fan, as you know, of um, ecology. I, I'm, and eco art and eco art photography. I believe that the landscape, photos of the landscape, tell, they reflect our environments, the picture of who we are within our environments. And actually, we're going to read the effect of what we've done to our environments within these photos. So I find them there, I find photography and, um, other forms of art very helpful in identifying uh, ecological needs and, and that kind of thing. So tell me more, what are your goals for the future where this is concerned? What would you like to see happen? Well, what I would like to see happen is for um, more people to learn how to sort of read landscapes. Um, and that starts with just being able to identify what's around you. But I guess, generally speaking, what, what I would love to see is just a, an increase in, you know, environmental literacy and people feeling grounded within their landscapes. Long Island has such unique um, ecosystems. And I didn't know that growing up here. Um, you know, I saw a forest and it was a forest. Um, I didn't know that we had the Pine Barrens and that, that the heritage of that was so specific to Long Island and, um, you know, sort of, I had a really wonderful, wonderful teacher in college and um, I took conservation biology with her. And the first thing, on the first day of class, she handed out some questions and they were things like, what was, when was the last full moon? Do you know where your water comes from? What is the most common tree species where you live? Um, you know, they were all questions to kind of realize ways in which you could be grounded in your environment. I mean, as humans, we're, we're natural, you know, it's sometimes it doesn't seem like it, or it, it doesn't, uh, you know, the narrative that's prevalent doesn't, uh, 
align with that, but I believe that humans are natural and we feel at home in our ecosystems and I certainly do. And um, so what I guess I would love to see for people to engage with that and sort of become familiar with that and really learn to care about these ecosystems and um, just start looking closely at what they are. And well, I'm fairly sure with your impact, you will have an impact with your passion. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And I want to thank you so very much. We're going to run out of time and Zoom will cut me off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so very much. Now, Lindsay, how do people contact you and how do people get involved with your organization? So go to our website, which is lisma, L-I-I-S-M-A dot org. Um, and our contact, my contact information is there. Um, we welcome all kinds of volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering, please let me know. Um, we actually right now have a bio blitz happening. Um, and that's basically where as many people as possible use iNaturalist to document as many species as they can. Um, and it's really fun. It's like a scavenger hunt. And it also really helps us uh, get a sense of what's on the landscape. So that's a great way to get involved um, right now. But um, as you know, always feel free to contact us with questions or if you're interested in volunteering another way. Just one quick question, one last quick question. How many young people are you able to involve? Is this a young, is this like a, an educational program for young people? Do they really enjoy it? So I've just been in my, this particular position since December actually. So I'll, I have yet to see that, <laughs> okay. but um, I hope so. And um, you know, this is our first year doing the bio blitz. We're partnering with the Long Island Sound Study in doing that. And we hope that in future years, um, teachers will get involved and do this with their students. There is an invasive species curriculum that um, New York State has developed oh, um, that's that's really great for getting kids kind of out um, and, and learning about invasive species. So there, there definitely, definitely are opportunities to engage kids. It's a great activity for kids. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your um, knowledge and, and being so willing to explain to us how to identify invasive species and how to be part of, a, of the resolution for the issue with invasive species. So thank you again for joining me. Thank you for having me.